My name is Hal Hester. Welcome to Vine Life. Good to have you this morning. Good to see you. Hope that you are doing well. Hope that uh, you are find yourself growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. And if this is your first time here, or if you're just exploring what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus, my hope is that through this morning that you will have an encounter with him that will leave you with many reasons more to continue your pursuit. Well, hey, uh, before we get started this morning, I was just thinking uh, so much about what John was saying and uh, about remembrance. And of course, you know, communion is, is all about remembering what Jesus did for us. Um, but as he was talking about that, just kind of hitting on that theme, uh, you know, there uh, actually in, in the past, it's, it's so old, it's becoming new again. There were books, tons of books written on the theme of remembrance theology, just uh, uh, lots of papers written years ago. Uh, in fact, if you would, uh, if you just think in terms of the book of Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, and literally the entire theme of the book is remembrance. Remember what God did in the former times. Remember what he said to you. Remember who you are as you enter into the land. Uh, don't ever forget. Uh, it's so critical to our relationship and understanding who God is and how he works in and through us uh, that it begins from this place of remembering who God is and uh, understanding our relationship with him, where it began. And so uh, let me encourage you, uh, along with John, uh, to uh, really take some time and explore the theme of remembering uh, just throughout the scriptures. Wonderful, wonderful theme. All right, well, <clears throat> so uh, listen, over the last few months, we have been in the Gospel of John. Speaking of remembering, we have been in the Gospel of John for a while now, and uh, you know we've tried each week to kind of build in such a way that uh, you, if you haven't been here, you can catch on to what we're doing. Uh, on the other hand, I would encourage you, uh, if you, as you're digging into the Gospel of John with us, if you find uh, yourself in, intrigued about some of the things we're saying, references, to other things, uh, please feel free to go back and listen to uh, the you know recordings uh, uh, early on in the series, and I think that you'll find those things <clears throat> really useful. But throughout this Gospel of John, we've really focused on, as you saw in just the the little video there, the theme of eternal life. It is the central theme to the Gospel of John, and so throughout this biography of the life of Jesus. Uh, the kingdom of God is expressed in a unique way in all the other gospels and all the other biographies of Jesus. Uh, it talks about either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven uh, interchangeably, uh, the, the kingdom of God being specifically the rule and the reign of God, uh, the kingdom of heaven expressing more the concept that the all of what is known as heaven uh, is summed up in the rule and the reign of God, the presence of Jesus in the world, and how that's breaking forth into our world, bringing the sense of the hope of heaven uh, into the world around us, more specifically, that bringing that hope of heaven through you. And so that throughout the passage, the, uh, throughout the, 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 the gospel, there's the use of the word life, not drawing on the typical word for life, like in biological life, in fact, the word bios, the word for life in the Greek, is that same word from which we get our term biology, the study of life. Uh, and, and so uh, most of the time in the Greek, it's built on that one word, right? We're just talking about physical existence. And yet there's also these words in Greek that communicate uh, quality of life, in particular in the Gospel of John, the words sozo and zoe, speaking of a sense of life that is transcendent, a one that's full of expectation, of the idea that God is at work in our world, that he's engaging us, he's engaging the world around us, and primarily that the expectation throughout the Gospel of John is that you and I would experience eternal life, the abundant life, the sozo kind of life in the here and now, and that through us, that people would taste and see that God is good, that through us, they would see that the rule and the reign of heaven, of God, is being expressed through our lives. And this would be a, the drawing, that the primary way in which the early church ex was so explosive in its growth and how it continues to explode in growth around the world 
although not currently in the United States and other Western countries, but how the gospel is expanding around the world is primarily the engagement with the life of Christians. In other words, when they see Christians behaving, acting differently, when they see a life that is filled with hope, a life that is filled with abundance, a life that is transformed, that they are attracted to the gospel. They see that God is good. They see his work in us is good and that, that the overflow of that brings hope and a sense of expectancy to the world around us. Too often, in the modern expression of the gospel in the Americas, in the West, the message of the gospel is, well, don't look at me, only look at Jesus. And we use it as a thin veil to cover up for the fact that there is a lack of transformation, a lack of life change, and that we've kind of convinced people that the gospel is simply just say a prayer and you won't go to hell. I don't know about you, but it's not really full of vision or expectancy. It's not a life that people are all that attracted to. And so we find ourselves in the greatest decline in Western history right now why we've preached this other gospel that is unable to transform, unable to change lives. And we're inviting people to come and sit on Sunday mornings to something that if it doesn't work for you, why would it work for me? Here into the midst of this, we find in the Gospel of John something completely different, a compelling vision of life transformed by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, of lives changed so that the rule and the reign of God is expressed through our lives so that it becomes invitational, so that it becomes transformational. And the idea of not of just you and I getting into heaven, but heaven getting into us so that we are a completely different kind of people in which people look and see not only that God is good, but in the present, they experience the abundant eternal life. This week, we're going to look at Jesus' admonition of his disciples about trial, about persecution, and about abandonment. At the times when in life all seems lost, Jesus speaks to them and says, do not fear. And the promise is, is that the champion of the universe is on your side. And th this text is just loaded with numerous lessons from the very pragmatic to cultural expectations in Jesus' day and teachings from Jesus about God's abiding presence, even in the midst of storms. But most importantly, to be an encouragement to us to know that the undisputed cosmic champion is on our side no matter how tough things may seem. With that in mind, let's open our Bibles and take a look. We're going to be in John chapter 16 today. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. If you're using a phone or tablet, please set that to silent for the sake of those around you. I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version, but please follow along in whatever translation you have. The one in your lap is my absolute favorite because that's the one you're reading today. Let's take a look. John 16, 16, we read these words. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, well, what does this mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me again and a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. 
so also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will ever take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And in that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. The disciples said, Oh, now you are speaking plainly and not figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. Well, I want to remind you before we get started of kind of the larger context here, right? Uh, because it's really important. Otherwise, it's really kind of easy, especially with today's message, to just lift it out of its context and then go preaching places and say things that it doesn't say. And so it's really important for context, context, context. I, I know you probably get tired of me saying it. That's a sign that you're actually starting to hear. So, um, uh, Context, context, context. Our context here is John chapters 13 through 17. So we're, we're right at the end of 16, getting ready to go into 17. And if you'll remember, uh, if you were here with us, if you haven't, uh, the reason 13 through 17 uh, is important as a single context is that these events are all occurring over this is one night right so we started with Jesus meeting with the disciples and in the upper room and communion and everything this is all still the same night and so Judas is gone off to go do his deed uh, and Judas is getting ready to betray Jesus Peter has made the promise that no way would he ever betray Jesus if anybody else betrays him uh, that that will be on them but not him he would never do that and of course we're being set up uh, in the context if you and I'd never read the story or heard the story before you know we're it's it's setting it's queuing everything up and the contrast then is between the two betrayals he will indeed betray Jesus, as will Judas. And the difference that really stands between the two is one delves into a kind of worldly sorrow in which he allows it to destroy him and he takes his own life. Whereas Peter has this revelation of just who Jesus is and as he remains then Jesus is able to restore him three times once for every time that he denied him and so I, I've, I, I said when we were there uh, I, I want to repeat to you again can you imagine if Judas had remained like Peter did, if he had waited and hadn't destroyed his own life, like the stories we would tell today about how Judas was restored, just like Peter. We have a redemptive gospel. We have one in which no one 
is too far away to be redeemed. Here in this context, it being all one evening as things are unfolding, uh, we've been talking about the role of the Holy Spirit and the promise that the Holy Spirit was coming to them, uh, preparing their hearts. Uh, These last words, chapters 13 through 16, are are getting them ready for the events that are going to take place in chapter 17, which is that in chapter 17, he will go off, he will pray, and they will be trying to pray and stay up with him, but in the last, they're Their flesh, uh, you know, their spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak, and they give in, and they go to sleep at a most critical moment, just before all the events unfold. Jesus is preparing them. It's his last opportunity to speak to them. And we see from the chaos of that night, as we get into chapter 17 and and 18 and all, that how they were seemingly completely unprepared for what's about to happen. It's not that they haven't been prepared by Jesus. It's not that he hasn't told them these things all along. It's that right now they're still wrestling through what they think, what they've been taught. And so there's just going to be this shaking that's going to occur as they finally let go of tradition and what they want for what God is actually doing in the world. So Jesus warns his disciples about his impending arrest and death, uh, which is literally about to happen, right? And and so they're asking the question, what does it mean by a little while? And it's a fair question to ask because if you take some time and you go through the entire Bible and you read a little while, you start getting the hint that a little while in God's mind and a little while in your mind are two completely (laughs) different things. Right? I mean, so, like, the the expectation of the early church is, in a little while, Jesus is coming back. We're in the 21st century going, what does that mean, a little while? Because, listen, in every generation, the church has had to wrestle with that. In the day, in in the Apostle Paul's day, he said, be ready. And in fact, one of the problems in the early church was that people were like quitting their jobs and like, you know, and, and doing things because they're like, any day now, Jesus is coming back and I can't stand that bum I'm working for and everything. And then, and then all of a sudden they were broke and hungry and then like pleading the church, rest of the church, well, you still got a job. Would you support me? And you know, it just doesn't do a lot for body life. I'm just telling you, it just, potlucks get really strained in a moment like that. Anyhow, no, but seriously, that, that kind of stuff was happening And if we look throughout church history, we see those kind of things happen again and again. That where people begin to try to predict, despite Jesus' words, I don't know, and the Father isn't revealing that, so be ready at every hour. But basically his words were, stop trying to predict. And yet, you know, every year on the bestseller list is, you know, how many reasons why Jesus is coming back this year or next year or the year after or if this thing just happens or if that thing just happens and <laughs> be ready because you might meet Jesus tonight and the world may go on for another thousand years but you might meet Jesus tonight. Hello? Hello? So always be ready. Nonetheless, there's this, this, this whole tension right there around those things in a little while. And so what's a little while in the mind of God isn't always what's a little while in the minds of men. And, and so in this particular instance, uh, Jesus is trying to get it through to them. And finally he says, look, I mean like it's imminent, like it's coming. And what they don't know is literally like in last, in just a few hours, this is going to take place. I'm going to be taken from you. These events are going to start to unfold. They're going to come and seize me. Judas is coming back for me uh, uh, with, the, with the guard, and they're going to take me away. And everything that you understood is going to get shattered in a moment. That's kind of a little while. In a little while, you will see me again. How little while? Well, in three days from now, uh, I will rise again. That's a little while, wouldn't you say? A little while. And then he says, and then a little while after that, I'll be coming back. 
2,000 years later, we're still waiting. So, a little while. It's, it's a fair question that they ask in the midst of all of this, right? What, are you, what do you mean by a little while? And, you know, honestly, though, God knows the beginning from the end. Uh, I think one of the things is that because of the patience of God, that he continually gives us time, that as he works through the realities of free will and still gets his will done, that I think it's a whole lot less about time and points in time and a whole lot more about just his willingness to delay in hopes that you and I will tell all of our neighbors our friends, our family, and even our enemies. That we would live our lives out loud in front of them in such a way that they could taste and see that he's good. What's a little while? I think a little while is as long as it takes for the church to be the church. Just a little while. And it could happen overnight, in which a great awakening within the church would begin to spill over into the lives of those around us, in which there would be great revival in the land and things would change in a moment, or it can take a really long, long time when we can't be made uncomfortable or when we're constantly looking for the solid ground of peace in this life, forgetting about the life in the world to come. Now, in the midst of this, keep in mind that as you look over the Gospel of John, Jesus often left his disciples for periods of time, uh, you know, to go and be alone and pray. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's this, this whole aspect of just his relationship with them has been uh, ones of intense periods of where they were ministering together, and then other times where Jesus would leave them alone sometimes for months at a time, uh, let them go back to fishing uh, or doing whatever it was they were doing. Uh, in the case of Matthew, he didn't have to go back to be a tax collector anymore. He had plenty of money. And, um, uh, but you know, that, that there's, he would just leave them alone for periods of time. Sometimes they would travel together. Sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, but Jesus would go and pray and, and spend time with the Father. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that even in Jesus, we have this just deep-centered example of that, how important it is for us to spend time with the Father if we want to walk in the way that Jesus walked, if we want to minister in the way that Jesus ministered. And so we have that piece in the whole puzzle. Secondly, we have the problem of religious tradition where they're expecting the Messiah to be a mighty military commander. And I still hear a lot of this sometimes in people's reading of the book of Revelation and things like that, uh, you know, instead of, and so we just switch targets. Uh, for them, they were confident that the Messiah would not only be a mil mighty military commander, but he would and he would destroy Roman rule and that he would use signs and wonders to to you know, feed the armies of Israel, to raise their soldiers from the dead like Ezekiel, and to wage war not only in terms of battle, but then to even co-opt the elements like Moses defeating Pharaoh at the Red Sea, or like using the shouts to bring down the walls of Jericho. And so there was no room in their theology, their hearts, or their minds for the cross. The cross is not like any of those things, is it? I mean, the, the cross does not scream victory. Although, here's the promise to us. In, in the book of Colossians, it says that the cross was not only victory, but it was the very place that when they, in the gotcha moment of when they thought that, that they had completely defeated him, that it says that in that moment that he made a spectacle, he made a laughing stock, he made foolish the powers of this world. The 
cross is victory. It's not just victory in the sense of that you and I get our sins forgiven. It's this big sea change for the entire cosmos. It's, it's the unleashing of things, not only forgiveness, but the, the, the righting of all things so that one day when, he's, when we stand before him in the great day of judgment, the great day of the Lord, that he will set everything to right. He'll make things right. Not just theoretically right, actually right. The answer for you when anytime someone asks, like, what about a God who, there's still suffering in the world, there's still difficulty and pain, and the answer is always the cross. We're pointing back to that cataclysmic moment when everything was upended and, and the world does it, the cosmos doesn't even know it yet. And as heaven breaks into this world, one heart at a time, things really do change. You really do become a new creation in Christ, if you will let him. The cosmos changes. Things are happening in the universe. And eventually all those things come to fruition. But there was no place in their minds for Jesus not to be a mighty military commander, for Jesus not to destroy Rome. And so they couldn't see what he was doing. There was certainly no room for rescuing Romans. Right? I mean, like, these are the people we don't like. These are the people who've made our life difficult. And, and maybe even right now, as you think about it, maybe even your theology doesn't have a lot of room for who? The people in the other political party. Because everybody knows that my political party is more like Jesus than your political party. Maybe, maybe God, you know, I mean, rescuing everybody but Palestinians, everybody but Jews. Rescuing Ukrainians but not Russians. Who, in your heart or mind, are God's arms too short to reach? Maybe it's different people of other different persuasions to you. Whatever it was, was distinctly off the table in their minds, is, is the very point at the very point of where the gospel comes to bear, right? That what he's doing and changing lives and the power of the gospel is going to turn the entire cosmos upside down so that anyone, everyone, the entire cosmos has the opportunity. Whether or not it yields, not every knee will bow, not every tongue will confess. But distinctly, there was no room for them for the cross in their minds. And so Jesus knew it, and he warned them. These events were coming in hot. They were about to be blown away. And so he says, in a little while, you'll see me no longer. Then you'll see me again, but then you'll see me no longer. And they're kind of going back and forth. And, they're, and then I love what they say is, well, God, now, thankfully, you've been, you quit talking in, in rhetorical terms and you talked really plainly, so we completely understand what you mean. Not. <laughs> what he's talking about is not just going away for three days and then him rising again. He's talking about that moment that will come when he will go to be with the Father. And you'll no longer see me until I return in glory. And what I want you to know is in that moment, you will never be alone. Because I have the victory. 
when, when you read that in the 21st century, it's not shocking. It's easy to process. We just simply go, okay, you know, they're, you know, it was different for them. It's not different for me. But, but verse 20, when he says, you will weep, but the cosmos will rejoice. One of those ways that we read this text often really misses the point. Actually, when he says there that you will weep, he actually what he says there is you will be in travail. Think a woman giving birth. Most translations say the world will rejoice. And so our way of looking at it is, well, you know, okay, yes, the, the, you know, all the worldly forces are going to just dance on the grave of Jesus. Even one of my favorite commentaries suggests he's actually just talking about the Jewish leaders, you know, celebrating the death of Jesus. But I want to tell you why none of that fits and doesn't make sense. See, if you and I look at the rest of chapters 13 through 16, the word that is actually being translated world over and over again is actually the word cosmos. He's not just talking about terra firma. When he's talking about the world, he means like the whole thing. All that is life and present in the universe. Just different set of words than we use today. Uh, but uh, in that sense, he's not using the word secularis. He's not talking about the secular powers. He's not talking about the powers in opposition to him. He's talking about that the entire cosmos, everything that he spoke into being, he says, is going to rejoice even though you will be weeping. Now, why is that? Why? Would the cosmos rejoice at Jesus' death? Well, let me ask you to reference Romans chapter 8. Now, don't go there right now, please. Please, please, please. I want to keep your attention, you know. I, but I do want to encourage you, after the message today, go home and read Romans chapter 8. And read about the travail. And there, when it talks about the, 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 the travail, uh, it's talking about how that literally the cosmos has been in travail for eons. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in Romans chapter 8 signals that help is on the way and that one day soon the sons of God, you and me, male and female, ladies, if I can be the bride of Christ, you can be a son of God for a moment, okay? Right? These are, not, these are not gender terms. I'm the bride of Christ. You want to, every guy in here needs to be the bride of Christ. Every woman in here needs to be a son of God. It's talking about position. It's talking about uh, uh, categories, not, not uh, gender roles. Then all that is past, with all of its heartbreak, its death, its disease, its destruction, it says, will be forgotten because God will make everything right and the wicked we are promised in Isaiah will be forgotten. Though even now I weep at the thought, we're told by Isaiah that there will be a day when we, because as we embrace his presence and his goodness and that he has set all things right, all that is sad, destructive, and those who would not receive will be forgotten. But at that moment, in this moment in the text, that's not their perspective. And that's why the Holy Spirit had to reveal it to them at a later time because there was more than they could grasp. They were just about to encounter this whole thing where Jesus is going to be taken from them and ripped from them. And so in a last-ditch effort, right? I mean, we're, we're going to go just a few verses here, and next thing you know, they're going to be in the garden, and then all these events are going to happen. And, and all. So he's just one last thing, and he tells them, listen, I, I know right now some things are going to happen, and, and you're going to see me be taken away, and you're going to see things happen to me that you can't explain because it doesn't fit your theology. It 
doesn't fit your worldview. And what I'm telling you is, hang on! Help is on the way. Because, and this is one of my favorite parts, I am Nike! You're saying, wait, Jesus is a tennis shoe? No, Nike stole the word from Greek. It means champion. When you put that little thing on your shirt right there, you're saying, I'm the champion, which is kind of funny when you lose the race. But anyhow, um, <laughs> but I was wearing Nike, so I get a trophy anyhow. No. <laughs> Bad pastor. Um, <laughs> champion. And he's telling them this. He says that whenever I, when these things happen, I want you to know that I am victorious in that moment. I want you to remember those things because it's not going to look like that. And you're going to fret and you're going to fear and you're going to feel abandoned and you're going to feel alone. And I want you to know in those moments when you feel like that is happening, truth is not your feelings in the moment. Can you just, can I please, like, can I park there for a second? Your feelings are not the truth. Your feelings are just your feelings. That's okay to have feelings. Please don't hear me dissing on your feelings. I in no way would diss your feelings. Your feelings are very real. You actually feel that way. And so maybe in a moment you felt alone. Maybe you felt in a moment that God didn't care. I mentioned last week, I'll say it again, Job, in a couple of moments, kind of felt forgotten. And the way Job makes it through is he just keeps calling out to God. He keeps telling God about what he's feeling, about what he's going through, and, and, but he never loses contact with God. He doesn't run from God, and that's how he makes it through the most difficult season in his life and how all this restoration comes to his life. And that's the, that's the same kind of thing that you and I are, are holding on, looking for another day, for that day in which heaven and earth will collide, in which the kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign of God will fill the earth and all things will be set right. You and I long for that day. But in the meantime, you might have some feelings. Hardship, difficulty, abandonment. But listen, he's the champion of the cosmos. The whole cosmos is groaning, longing, and waiting for the day in which the sons of God will be revealed, in which everything will shift, everything will change. It's not just that he overcame the spirit of the age, but he has championed the cause of the entire universe so that the whole universe has hope. The entire cosmos can be made new. The heavens, the earth, and everything in them, and if everything in the universe is coming under his rule and his reign, that's what it means when we say heaven has come down. That's actually what we mean as Christians, when we think of the future heaven, it's not jettisoning and escaping this cosmos and going some faraway place. It's the idea of heaven crashing in and that heaven and earth become one and the veil that was once separating us is torn and we see the entire cosmos for the way it actually is. Not the veiled view that you and I see everything very one-dimensionally. Remember when Jesus went to the cross and in that moment as he died that the veil was torn so that there would no longer be separation. He's not just talking about your ability to go in and pray. He's given a foretaste of a world in which heaven crashes into our world Heaven gets into us, and the entire cosmos gets changed. Why would you bother living differently in this world today? Why would you care for the earth? Why would you worry about your neighbor?
because he's going to transform the whole thing. The whole enchilada. He's coming back. And every knee will bow. Every knee. Both the living and the dead. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then he will separate them like a shepherd shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And to those on his right, they will go forever into his eternal happiness. And to those on his left, a different eternity. Why? We believe that the eternal God is extending an invitation to everyone in the cosmos to come and live under his rule and reign. And if you don't like his rule and reign, there'll be nothing particularly joyful about that day. If you don't like mercy, if you don't like forgiveness, If you don't like kindness, if you can't love your neighbor, if you won't forgive your enemies, you're not going to like when the kingdom of heaven takes over the rule and reign of the entire cosmos. See, it's not about escaping hell. That's just the side Benny. We make it the the whole deal. It's the side Benny. See, the whole deal is that you and I get to spend eternity with the champion of the cosmos who has fought on your side and for you, and that he is extending mercy and grace and forgiveness not only to you but to your enemies, that you and I can not only be forgiven but that we can have things set right and the the things that have happened to us, the things, the transgressions that have been waged against us, that those things could be set right, that you could come into a place in the presence of God where you could forget All the former things, you could finally let go of what happened to you, what that person did to you, of those events that unfolded, of the things that you couldn't understand why, uh, and, and, and that you don't need an answer anymore because in His presence, where all those things are made right, you've forgotten the former things. Because in there is hope and joy and, in fact, actually... It's no longer hope because hope has been realized. And you have the concrete reality of the kingdom of God ruling and reigning all over everything where all of creation bows its knee and knows that Messiah is king. That all creation has humbled itself before the victor. And sadly, those who will not humble itself will still bow and then depart. But the powerful thing for you and I is this. That in those moments when you and I are feeling overwhelmed by the world and the circumstances that are surrounding us, when we are... uh, travailing, when we find ourselves in great pain, and uh, listen, that, that travail that so often we spend a lot of energy trying to avoid is the very thing that God uses to shape and to put things in order in the universe, and that there is purpose in all of the pain and the difficulty and the sorrow, and that He is putting all things to rights, and that you and I do not just stand outside of it as people spectating, uh, as, as 
followers of Christ, you and I don't suddenly become spectators and get pulled out of the travail and escape it, but instead that you and I enter into the travail just like Jesus entered into the travail, that he who had no sin that he came into this world, he injected himself into the midst of our pain and sorrow. He's not an escapist. He didn't have to. Nothing said he had to. Do you know that he didn't have to die for your sins? He didn't have to. But God so loved the world. That's why he gave his son. Your travail is not because God has forgotten you. Your travail is not because he doesn't care. Your travail is part of this whole thing where he's allowing us in his mercy, his kindness, to work all those things out, and he will wipe the slate clean in the end. But in the interim, in the midst of your free will and mine, anybody here like your free will? Come on, be honest. In the midst of your free will and mine, God is working all things out. It's called travail because it brings forth life. Now, please, ladies, I I don't want to do any mansplaining. But my understanding, as I talk to women, is that as difficult as birth is, afterwards, you tend to forget. That's how you get duped into having a second one, right? I know, it's just going to be a back rub. But, you know, I, I, I just, the point being is this, right? You forget. And in the midst of your travail... Not just the travail of the giving birth, but the reality, I'm bringing a child into this world. And I look around and I go, why would anybody want to bring anybody into this world? And then that little life comes in and everything changes. And you would do anything. You will do anything. see that child come to fruition, to see the plans of God unfold, and you will say in the end, it was worth it, will you not? Guys, you don't get left out, especially if you're there and you're holding her hand and you suddenly like find out that she can bring you to your knees with one grip. And you and I, guys, we will, alongside of them, we will weather the difficult, the, 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 the circumstances that we never expected to, sometimes even rebellion and hardship. Sometimes it will be sweetness. Sometimes they will say and do things to our face. And yet there is nothing sweeter than when your own child looks you in the face and says, thank you. I love you. When you see their life become victory, and I'm telling you that the God of the universe, the champion of the cosmos, looks upon the travail and the hardship and all the difficulty, and when you're trying all your best to avoid all those things. He knows what it brings forth, and he's looking at the long run. He's looking at the final victory. He's looking at the championship of the universe, and in the midst of that, he says, you're not alone. I'm with you. I'm going through you in the midst of your circumstances, your trials, your difficulties. I'm standing there with you when your enemy curses you, when your enemy comes against you. And if you will travail with me, I'll bring you into victory. I will bring you into a time and a season in which the will 
of the Father has done throughout the entire cosmos. And all that is against it will be vanquished. And all that is for him will receive that great reward. So in this life, travail is part of the package. We as Westerners, we spend so many hours praying that travail doesn't happen. But I'm telling you, church, that if you really want God's will to be done perfectly in the cosmos, that if you want the reign of heaven where there is no more pain and no more sorrow and no more travail, you will take the hand of God in the midst of travail and you won't say no more. You'll say, God, what are you doing? How do I join you? And when, what does the good fruit look like? God, what does it look like when I'm no longer concerned about defeating Rome, when I'm no longer concerned about vanquishing my mortal enemies? God, what does it look like whenever I yield myself to your presence and to your power and that the power of the Holy Spirit begins to transform and conform me into his image and then suddenly, like the whole universe, takes on a different look. It, all the events, all those hardships, all those trials become something else entirely different. They become part of the victory. What does that look like? And God, how can I join you? Do not let the fear or the worship of comfort keep you from encountering God and engaging life now, waiting for someday. And then second, like if you find yourself in the midst of travail right now, I, I just want to urge you that God is not abandoning you. You live in a fallen world, and it's time actually to press in and say, God, what, what in the cosmos are you doing? Give me strength. Be with me in power and purpose. And if you've never been through travail, time to decide. Can I urge you with all that is within me, with all that is within you. Just like in this moment, before all hell broke loose, Jesus urged them to trust him for what was about to happen. And I'm not speaking against you, just hear me. Travail is going to come your way. And you want to decide those things now so that you don't have to decide them in the midst of your pain. You want to decide those things now, while his mercies are new every morning, so that you do not have to decide them in a moment of loss, in a moment of persecution, of an unexplainable anguish, cruelty, or whatever else. When the person that you trusted turns against you, but I promise you, Jesus knows what all of those things are like. And yet, here's his message. Not escape. The rule and the reign of heaven in the midst of it. Won't you come? Won't you come? There's lots of philosophies in the world that will tell you how to escape all your pain and sorrow. The thing that stands out about Christianity, real Christianity, is it says, now here in the midst of that, I will walk with you. I am the God of your sorrows. I know that's not really sexy. I hope that what you recognize is it is real. Let's stand together. <clears throat> the champion's on your side. Do not be dismayed. The victory is his in a little while. 
in a little while. And you and I, we stand here in the midst of wondering what a little while means. But what I can promise you is that the big gap between now and then really is very dependent upon our response to Jesus. As the kingdom of God advances over the face of the earth, some 2.2 billion followers now, we see how the kingdom of heaven has uh, begun to change the face of the earth, uh, the sense of expectation, and where the kingdom of God goes, how it changes society and changes the, the expectations of how people treat one another in the world and things like that. There's this invitation uh, that how the kingdom of God is advancing and for you and I to get hold of that, to embrace it, and for the kingdom of heaven to continue to advance in the face of hardship and difficulty and challenges and pain and everything else. And so the question is, not what series of events can happen here or there or somewhere else, but will I avail myself to the power and the presence of God? Will I avail myself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and will I be transformed? And will my neighbors be transformed by the sharing of the gospel? Will my life become a sense, of a place where people can taste and see that the Lord is good? And the answer to the quick return of Jesus, it, there in the book of Acts, the promise is made that when this gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout the earth, then the end will come. There is this design built in within it, not in terms of dates and times, but in terms of expectation that our, all of our enemies, our friends, our family, and everyone would hear the good news of Jesus Christ and have the chance to respond. And what he's waiting on is for the church to respond in a sense of expectation, to pour out their lives in a way in such that we would go to those enemies as well as to our friends and family we would go to those people who are the off limits we would go to our romans we'd go to our samaritans we'd go to our greeks we go to the very ends of the earth that we would pour our lives out in the confidence that if we will do that that he will come again so the invitation is multifold. Let me say first, like, that you would go. As you're going, make disciples. Could be that God has called you just to minister right here in Brooksville. Could be that God has called you to minister somewhere else in the state of Florida. Uh, maybe uh, you're supposed to be part of a church planting team uh, to just go to the next county, to the other side of the state. Uh, maybe God has called you to the ends of the earth. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe just to another state, I don't know. But that you and I would respond, God, what are you doing in the earth and how can I join you? And secondly, God, what are you doing in me? In the midst of my difficulty, trials, and pains that come to everyone, like, Lord, what do you want to do in me and through me? I surrender. I will trust you with my circumstances. I will trust you with my pain. It doesn't mean that you enjoy it doesn't mean that you go, oh, man, I can't wait for another difficulty to hit my life. It means you ask the question, God, what are you doing in the world? And not how can I get out of it, but how do we walk forward together for the most kingdom benefit to extend the good news to the ends of the earth? So I'm going to ask our prayer team members, go ahead and come on up. If you'd like prayer for anything this morning, it could be something that we talked about, uh, could be other things that you feel, you know, that are on your heart. Maybe uh, you need prayers for some physical healing or some uh, financial situation in your life. Like, you can come get prayer for those things, even though we didn't mention those this morning. Or maybe you come this morning and you simply say, like, Lord, in the midst of travail, what are you doing and how do I stand with you? Lord, in the midst of my circumstances, how do I understand what you're up to? And God, how would you have me go? To my friends, to my neighbors, to my Judea, to my Samarita, to the ends of the earth. How, how would you have me go? Here I am. 
send me. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit vinelife.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook and Instagram. God bless you as you love God, love people, and pass it on. We'll see you next week.